<laughs> because we're just, Give yourself we, time. Mm. you know, it's the Martha syndrome. You're, we're worried and bothered about so many things. Yet, ask yourself the question, what difference will it make a week from now, mm -hmm. a month from now? Yeah. Most of the stuff yeah. we stress yeah. about on a daily basis is not that important. I remember when my kids were little, catching myself saying, hurry up, hurry up, yes. so many times in the course of one day. Saying this to my children, I'm thinking, I am training my kids to constantly be in rush motion. Cultivating panic. Exactly. Absolutely. When I should be calm myself, and then that cultivates mm -hmm. calm in the home. And, and so I really had yes. to chastise myself yeah. and say, stop saying hurry and just be more organized and don't expect so much. Well, yeah. and we're in this, this fast-paced society where with our cell phones and Blackberries and email, we expect immediate responses. Uh, we, yeah. And, yeah. you know, we live at such a pace that is not normal. I just, uh, I came back two years ago from living in Europe for two, for two years. Oh my gosh, the pace is so much slower. And I realized they look at us like, you crazies. Why are you, you running around at such a fast pace? And you take a deep breath and go, Oh, I'm missing. We miss really deep and meaningful connection mm -hmm. because we're running mm -hmm. through life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I do think that's part of why women are saying, what happened to my life? You happened to your life. <laughs> that's you a know, good one, yeah. Yeah. Jesus got away and he rested and he had that's this important. calm about him because I think, you know, we need to recapture that calm because mm -hmm. we can't operate. He wasn't trying to do everything. Exactly. Yeah. He only did what the Father showed mm -hmm. him. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and our expectations, again, back to the misery factor, mm -hmm. make us miserable. Yeah. Now, Bridget, yeah. you've, you've been yeah. trying yeah. to get something yeah. 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 like, oh, yeah. yeah. get in there. Um, one of the things that I loved in your book was you talked about making space for margins. Mm -hmm. uh, even this week, I'll give you an example. I went, I think it was Tuesday, and I, I got home, and I got to bed, and I'm like, I'm exhausted. And then I was like, what did I do today? <laughs> well, you know what I mean? Like, what did right. I do today? And I thought, like, and here's the thing. For me, I'll admit personally, it is really hard for me to make margins, even with my walk with the Lord. Like, I will, my thing is to read the Bible before I go to bed at night. And last year it worked for me, but this year, like, I'm literally reading, and, like, I've woken up with my forehead in between the pages. <laughs> and I'm just like, something is not yeah. working here. And right. then I have to sit back and say to myself, what am I doing that when I get, when I finally get to have my alone time with the Lord, I am exhausted that I'm just like, it's oh, that God, commute. Can, I, can I talk yeah. to you tomorrow, yeah. you know? Yeah. Or, like, yeah. it's just one of those things. So just talk about the, the whole thing about mm -hmm. making margins And margins, life. Dr. Swenson wrote about it in a book of the same name, and it's always impacted me because I love, you think about reading mm -hmm. a book that has no paragraph indentations, it has no space between sentences. <laughs> well, that, if we, if our time looks like that, there's, oh, there's a little space I can stick that in. We need margin in our life to keep us, you know, nose above water, still breathing and connecting. And for me, one of the margins, and this is something I've really had to work hard at because it doesn't come naturally, is putting Jesus first in the morning. Mm -hmm. And before I get out of bed, I try to have even just two or three minutes after my alarm goes off to, to lay there and think, okay, Jesus, it's all about you today. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and put margin in it. And, and then to, to have, even if it's only five minutes in the Word, to do the first things first. Mm -hmm. And then all day long, it's choosing the best from all the good. Mm -hmm. It's not saying yes to everything. That, that N-O word is very powerful and mm -hmm. it's okay. And I think we, as women, especially busy women, we feel guilty because we're capable of so much and yet we're not supposed to take it all on. And so I'm always looking at my day going, what can be removed? What is not essential? If I can push it off till tomorrow, can I push it off completely? <laughs> and you know, uh, granted, hard. there are seasons. There are yeah. seasons. Working moms, people going to school and work. But you have to look at where can I put it in. And you know, I think it's it's slashing. It's slashing the unnecessary out of our life. And, and necessary is rest. You know, I always complain that God made a 24-hour day, and if he'd made a 48-hour day, we'd only have to do our hair once and make our bed <laughs> once. And, and God's like, thank, thank the Lord that, that I didn't invent time because we need time for rest and regeneration and sleep. Every night when I, I go to bed exhausted as well, I think, why did you make us so weak, Lord? Mm -hmm. And he's like, because you need me. Mm -hmm. And it's just that reminder, we, we need margin on so many levels. So, so here's the thing though, because what, I'm, what I struggle with is realistic expectations. I've heard a lot of messages, some people are saying, live with no expectations. Mm -hmm. um, some have said, 
you know what, we have these high expectations because it helps to encourage, you know, uh, above mediocrity and excellence. But, you know, in your book, you talk a lot, a lot about realistic expectations. Right. But are those different for, you know, um, different people? Or what are realistic I expectations? I think it is. Well, I, you know, I think when we're seeking the Lord, if, if God lays something on our heart that he wants us to accomplish, he will give us the energy and the resources to accomplish it. But we don't have to always be pushing against the wind. In other words, um, we do strive for excellence, but what, are we doing it for us? Or are we doing it for him? As a young type A woman, I mean, I was a striver and I would pray and want something. I think, okay, we're gonna do this. And I think, come along God. Oh, it wasn't God's idea, it was mine. And so I think when God is inspiring something, you know, all the, not that it's easy, but the energy's there. And it's not about so much expectation as, um, just following the Lord. The difference between striving and thriving uh, in Psalms where it says, be still and know that I am God. In the NASB, it's cease striving and know that I am God. And yet he mm. doesn't say, cease trying to be excellent for me and giving your best and being all you can be for people. We're called to pour ourselves out. And but yet, if it's not God directed and then God we're, motivated, then we're it's drained. not God blessed. Yeah. And then we exactly. get disappointed because I think with yes. expectations on myself and others, I, I can get mm -hmm. disappointed a lot. Yes. Because you put expectations on people, they disappoint and let you down. You put expectations on yourself yes. and you let yourself down because you never achieve what you've set out to do. And you make a really good point between the difference between expectations of others and yourself. We have no control over others. And mm -hmm. so we can influence, we can hope, we can we pray, we can want, <laughs> we can, <laughs> exactly, we don't we? <laughs> don't we? We can influence greatly, but the more we're trying to control, yeah. the yeah. less our influence works. But what we have control over are our thoughts, Mm -hmm. And because we have control over our thoughts, we have control over our feelings, they follow, and certainly control over our own actions. And so the question is always, Lord, if I'm feeling discouraged, which is, this book is about finding, of course, contentment, if I'm discouraged and frustrated, and I've got that misery factor, what's off here mm -hmm. in my thought process? What is not connecting? Because mm -hmm. I don't think we'll feel that discontentment and that misery factor when we're in sync with his expectations. And that's always the reason. Dana, let me go to this, yeah. um, because I think it's huge in your journey. And you've been with us twice. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there's things about you we didn't know. <laughs> and you've been so vulnerable here. Mm -hmm. I didn't know about that first marriage and divorce. Mm -hmm. And you say, um, I had no idea that my misery would transfer to my two beautiful daughters. The biggest regret of my life is that I let my selfishness poison their lives. Yes. There had to come a place where you dealt with this joy stealer. You couldn't drag it through the whole rest of your life. The regret, oh, the remorse. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, tell us about that. Well, the marriage was over, obviously, and you, when I had two little girls, they were, they were seven and four at the time, and so very mm -hmm. vulnerable age. And you, you believe this lie, and I think many, many people believe this lie, both men and women. My kids will do so much better being away from an unhappy marriage. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, first of all, you don't have to show the kids all the strife in your, in your life. You can protect them and deal with it behind closed doors. But I believe that lie because it made it easier for me to walk away. But it was in the years following the divorce is over. I'm actually remarried. I'm watching the pain of my daughters live out. Now, you know, we, can, we can't undo the past mistakes if, if we've made a, a huge error. I didn't trust God. I had trusted God to heal me of bulimia and panic attacks, and yet I didn't trust Him with my marriage. But